Take up thy cross and follow me, I heard my master say. I gave my life to ransom thee, surrender your all today. Wherever he leads, I'll go. Wherever he leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so. Wherever he leads, I'll go. He drew me closer to his side. He sought his will to know. And in that will I now abide, wherever he leads I'll go, wherever he leads I'll go, wherever he leads I'll go, I'll follow my Christ who loves me so, wherever he leads me I'll go. My heart, my life, my all I bring to Christ who loves me so. He is my Master, Lord, and King. Wherever He leads, I'll go. Wherever He leads, I'll go. Wherever He leads, I'll go. I'll follow my Christ who loves me so, wherever he leads I'll go. Hello brothers and sisters in Christ, I wanted to sing that song. We're going to be doing a series of studies that's expository studies. I have a disagreement with the brother in Christ, so the best way to iron out that disagreement is just to do a Bible study. Okay, let's do a Bible study. And the whole point of that song, brothers and sisters in Christ, that hymn, is that this book here, we conform to this book. We don't force this book to conform to us. Okay, we don't play the yea hath God said game, a better rendering would be game. This book is the final authority. And Jesus is who we're supposed to be following, brother says Christ, not the flesh, not the world, and definitely not Satan. Those are the three enemies, remember that. The three enemies we have today is me, myself, and I. This guy right here is my number one enemy. Number two enemy is the world. And the ultimate enemy that's above those two things is Satan. And why do I put Satan above those two things? Because he tries to use our flesh against us. And he tries to use the world against us. But those are the three enemies, brothers of Christ. We're supposed to be following Jesus Christ. Okay? So before we get into this expository study, I wanted to do an intro, a little quick talk intro. We got 14 pages. I'm going to break this down in multiple parts. And instead of just, I could just hit the part where I disagree with the brother in Christ just like that. But the law, God put it on my heart and said, hey, let's do a Bible study. Let's try to learn something. And, and I had a brother in Christ said, make sure you're exhorting the brethren. I'm hoping this will exhort the brethren, encourage you, brothers and sisters of Christ. But before we get into the expository study, I want to uh, get in the right mindset, the right heart set. Mindset and heart set. Okay. So Proverbs 18.13. Proverbs 18.13 in your King James Bibles. This is just an intro video, so I'll be going through some verses. You can get your King James Bible out and you make sure you follow along. I'm a slow page turner. We'll turn to the first one. Proverbs 18.13. Proverbs 18, 13. But you can always pause the video, Brother Jesus Christ, turn there, which is what I do when I watch Brethren Studies. I pause the video, I flip to the page, and then I unpause the video. And for us to get through these studies within a reasonable time, like I said, a Brother Christ can put out an hour-long study. And for me, it might take me an hour and a half to get through it because I'm pausing it, flipping to it, unpausing it. Pausing it, flipping to it, unpausing it. It takes me longer to get through the video because I want to be reading along. Okay? So Proverbs 18.13 in your King James Bible, God's perfect written word in English. Okay? Proverbs 18.13 
He that answereth the matter before he heareth it, it is folly and shame unto him. Right. The reason I say that, there are some brethren that disagree with me on the context of 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. We're going to do an expository study on 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Right. Now after hearing me out, feel free to show me where I'm in, in the error according to the King James Bible. Remember, comparing Scripture with Scripture, 2 Timothy 2.15, rightly dividing the word of truth. Okay, After you've heard me out in this study, and you've done your own study, if I, there's times where I could be wrong. But one thing I guarantee you, Brother Sister Christ, the one thing I can guarantee 100%, this book is always right. God's word is always right. I might make mistakes. But if you go into it before you even hear me, if you go into it saying, he's wrong, he's wrong, he's wrong, he that answereth the matter before he hear that it is folly and shame unto him. Right. 2 Timothy 2.24, if you want to turn there, please. 2 Timothy 2.24. And the servant of the Lord must not strive, but be gentle unto all men, apt to teach, patient, in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. In meekness. We've talked about this a lot of times, Brother Says Christ. Not in pride. Not in anger. Not in bitterness. Not in envy. Okay? When you have people that say, I, I'm not listening because I, I, you're just 100% wrong. Well, did you hear the study? No, I didn't hear the study. I don't need to hear the study. I'm talking about among brothers and sisters in Christ. King James, Bible-believing, God-fearing brethren that we believe the same thing and that every once in a while something will pop up that we have a disagreement on. I don't have to listen to them. Yes, you do. Yes, you do. Now, I'm not talking about the wolves in sheep's clothing out there, false religions with the Bible perversions, false gospels, teaching that you can lose your salvation or you have to earn salvation or teaching that you go through the time of Jacob's trouble or turning their back on the pre-time of Jacob's trouble, catching away the body of Christ and on and on. I'm not talking about false religions with doctrines of devils. I'm talking about among the body of Christ. When there's a disagreement, are you listening? Or are you plugging your ears and going, I listen. I don't care what he says. I don't care what anyone else says. How many times have you heard preachers say that? I don't care what anyone else says. That's a prideful statement. That's not a Bible statement. That's a prideful statement. I care what Jesus says. I care what actual brethren say that have the Holy Spirit in them. God in them. That opens up the scriptures to me. Sometimes I've been corrected and I've been wrong. Sometimes brethren have corrected me and I've showed them where they're wrong according to the scriptures. And they got corrected. Okay? But we're correcting one another and we're, making, we're holding each other accountable to this book and we're supposed to. We're not supposed to have that attitude that I don't care what anybody else says, I'm going to believe what I'm going to believe. And I... No, your belief needs to line up with this book and the Bible teaches us that all scripture is given by inspiration of God and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, and for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, truly furnished unto all good works. Perfect written word of God is given to us so we can correct one another. And worst case scenario, if they refuse to listen, reprove one another. Okay? We're supposed to do it in meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. If God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth. And I've said this before, Brother Jesus Christ. If you're a jerk, if you come across as a jerk, prideful, a jerk, mean, snotty, you can go through all these different words. The wall comes up. They're not going to listen. You're not going to be able to reach them for Jesus Christ. In meekness. That's why the Bible says in meekness. Why? So, the, so if God peradventure will give them repentance to the acknowledgement of the truth. Okay. We need to do it in meekness. We need to do it with power and authority. We, this book has power and we have authority because we have God's perfect written word. And, and not just in our hands, brothers and Christ, in our hearts. Remember the Bible says it's not enough to be a hearer of the word, we need to be doers of the word. We take this, we hide it in our heart, and we live it. This book has power, and it has the authority. And that power and that authority is given to us to live a life of Christ. To encourage and exhort the brothers and sisters in Christ 
to live a life of Christ. To the acknowledgement of the truth. Verse 26. And that they may recover themselves out of the snare of the devil. Pride is of the devil. Okay. This book, lying, is of the devil. Adding to and subtracting from God's word, that's what Satan did to Jesus Christ when he was um, tempting him in the wilderness. That's what Satan does. Playing the yea hath God said, a better rendering would be game. That's of Satan. That's not of the word of God. That's of Satan. When we learn that in the word of God, that that's what Satan does. But bring him out of the snare of the devil. Oftentimes, when someone, when we have division in the body of Christ, brothers and sisters Christ, we have disagreement, this is getting in the way. Someone gets very prideful, puffed up, gets bitter. If it comes about the lust of the flesh, trying to justify lust of the flesh, we've got to mess this up so we can justify this flesh, body of flesh. We're conforming to the world. We're trying to please the world. We're compromising doing things the world's way instead of God's way. And like I said, Satan runs both of those. He tries to get you through your flesh. He tries to get you through the world. And get you to turn your back on absolute truth. Get you to turn your back on doing things God's way. Okay? May recover themselves out of the snare of the devil who are taken captive by him at his will. Now predominantly, lost world, preaching the gospel to them. When you preach the gospel, you do it out of love. Not pride, not ego, vanity. I keep saying ego, but I had a brother correct me. The Bible word is vanity. Not out of pride, not out of vanity. Not puffed up. We do it out of love. And we do it in meekness. We do it with authority. We have the truth. Do you want the truth? Okay. If you don't want the truth, okay. I'm going to go to somebody who does want the truth. That's not being prideful. That's just what the Bible teaches. They don't want the truth, and you tried, then you move to the next person. Okay. But you're going to do it in meekness. True love for the lost world is preaching the truth to them. In meekness. True love for brothers and sisters in Christ is preaching the truth to them. When they start falling to the right, or they start falling to the left, and they're not staying on that straight and narrow path, you preach the truth to them in love. And like I said before, our goal for a brother and sister Christ, if you truly love your brother and sister Christ, your heartfelt desire and goal is to see God build them back up. You, break, you see God break them down, and you go to them and repent, and you tell them they need to repent. Correction and um, all scriptures given by inspiration is proper for reproof and correction. And your whole goal is to see God build them back up. Your goal and your heartfelt desire is to see them get back on that, that right path. You know the brethren that don't have love for, for each other? They start getting into the name calling. The backbiting and whispering. The mocking. The character assassination. They're all about destroying the brother in Christ. Completely and utterly destroying them. They don't care to see them be built back up. They don't. They don't at all. Okay? They just want to see them completely be utterly destroyed. That's not someone who has love for brothers and sisters in Christ. That's someone who has hate in their heart for the brothers and sisters in Christ. Somehow that bitterness got into them so much that it just turned into hate. Victoria got up and got started walking around. Now all of them are going to get up. Go sit. You guys go sit. Go sit, Declan. Good boy. Brothers and Christ, that's not love. That's not love for brothers and sisters in Christ. That's hate. When you start forgetting, you've seen people do that. I started getting into it a little bit. There's times I've, I've had bad testimonies. There's times where I've been a jerk, brothers and sisters Christ. When I was facing uh, flat earthers, and when it comes to a globe earth, flat earth, we'll find out someday. Bible's not specific. Okay. And it's not a salvation issue. It's not an issue that's worth dividing over. Okay? There's a lot of things that are theories. They're theories. They're the theories are not worth getting dividing over. Okay, But I remember, I couldn't remember if it was a flat earther that I disagreed with, uh, a Trinitarian that I disagreed with, still hold on to Catholic Trinity, um, and not the Godhead of the King James Bible. Um, 
or if it was a post or mid-trib. But I was a jerk to them and sometimes. I got prideful, I got puffed up, and, in my, and when I was doing comments in the comment section of, of a brother's video, I was coming across as a jerk. Were they wrong in what they were standing for? Absolutely. Was I wrong in how I came across trying to preach the truth to them? Absolutely. We're not supposed to be jerks. Truth divides, brother says Christ. When you preach the truth, it divides just by preaching the truth. Do it with power and authority, but you're supposed to do it with love, and you're supposed to do it with meekness. The Bible says in sincerity and in truth. And we just read about meekness. We're supposed to be preaching the Word of God in sincerity and in truth. Sincerity means being sincere. We need to work hard on that. Turn to Proverbs 26.4. Proverbs 26.4. We did a study on this once, and it was kind of more it was more in depth, if you want to go watch it, about answering not a fool. Because it says two things. Proverbs 26, 4. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest he be lest thou also be like unto him. What does it mean by that? Well, a good example is I just gave you. If they're a jerk to me, I don't turn around and be a jerk to them. I'll be like lest thou be like unto them. Answer not a fool according to his folly. If they're a jerk to me, am I supposed to be a jerk to them? They call me names, am I supposed to call them names? They mock me, am I supposed to mock them? They be sarcastic towards me, am I supposed to be sarcastic towards them? No. Right. You get to verse 5, Proverbs 26, 5. Answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. There is a time we're supposed to answer a fool according to his folly. You got it wrong. Let me show you the truth. Now, the best way to distinguish between these two is if you turn to Proverbs 14.6. Proverbs 14.6. Okay. Best way to distinguish this, the best way I can tell you, when you're answering a fool according to his folly, when they're mocking you and they're trying to uh, bait you into a debate, an argument, into fighting, okay, Name-calling, mocking, railing for railing, backbiting and whispering. Right? Usually those are the types of people that this is talking about here. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. They don't want the truth. They're not seeking the truth. Proverbs 14.6 A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not. Why? Because he's, he's, I believe he's seeking man's wisdom. He's not seeking God's wisdom. He wants man's wisdom. And the Bible has his, has his number, ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? Because he's seeking man's wisdom. Thinking that's true wisdom. That's where I'm going to find true wisdom. And he findeth it not. He'll never find it there. The Bible also talks about, I think it's uh, Romans, the wisdom of this world. What God thinks of the wisdom of this world. But knowledge is easy unto him that understandeth. What do we understand, brothers of Christ? This is where we get our true wisdom from. Remember, wisdom is also life application. It's not just us studying the book and having head knowledge. It's we take this book and we apply it to our lives and we live it. That's why we have true understanding. We've been through it. We've applied this to our lives. We've lived it. But a scorner that seeketh after wisdom, a lot of times these people don't want to go through life experiences. They want to be wise without taking God's wisdom and applying it to their lives and living it and going through life experiences. Verse 17. Go, or verse 7, I'm sorry, verse 7. Go from the presence of a foolish man. When? See, there's, there's a clause here. You don't just go from the foolish man. When? Thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. The wisdom of the prudent is to understand his way. But the folly of fools is deceit. What's the deceit? They're not seeking truth. The best way I can separate Proverbs 26.4, Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest, he, lest thou also be like unto him, versus answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit, is you have someone who doesn't want the truth, and they're only there to distract you and get you to act like them. Get you on their level. 
down here. I'll put it down here. They're tr you're up here trying to serve God. This is absolute. God's word's absolute truth. I'm hiding in my heart. Thy word have I hid in my heart. I might not sin against thee. Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his way by taking truth, by taking heed thereto according to thy word. Sanctify him through thy truth. Thy word is truth. You're up here. They're down here, and they're trying to bring you down to their level. They have no interest in coming up to where you are. They don't want to be up here where you are. They are down here seeking man's wisdom, world's wisdom. They don't want the truth. And their whole point is to pull you down here. Those are the people you don't waste your time with. Those are the people you don't waste your time with. Now the other way is this. You're up here and you come across someone down here. And you talk to them. You start planting seeds. They come up a little bit. Why? Because you see in them, it's all about spiritual discernment, you see in them someone who has a love of the truth and they are actually seeking the truth. Okay? Is, is this person seeking to understand the truth or is he very met and, and very, is very messed up? Is he tru truly seeking the truth but he's just messed up? Doctrinally? Instruction righteous? By the flesh? By the world? Is he really messed up? And he's truly seeking the truth. It's the same thing about witnessing. This is mainly for brethren because this is a disagreement that I have with the brother in Christ. But even when we witness to the world, the lost world, when you see someone, might, there's some signs that they might be interested, you continue witnessing to them. If you see signs that they have no interest in the Word of God, don't talk to me, I don't care. You move on to somebody else because you're finding that person, you're planting seeds, you already planted seeds in that person that you tried to witness to, but when they don't want the truth, you keep moving until you find someone who might want a little bit of the truth. Then later on, they might want a little bit more of the truth to the point where they get up to where you are when it comes to witnessing. But it also comes with the brethren. Okay. Is this person seeking to understand the truth and is very messed up? Speaking as a fool. I have been here many times as a babe in Christ. I was a false convert. I was raised in the Babel building system. I was taught a lot of doctrines of devils. And when I got truly saved, I found out this book is, when I did the Bible version issue, if you've watched my testimony, I got led to the truth because I had the knowledge. I had the knowledge of Jesus Christ. I had the knowledge that he died for, for the sins of the world and that he was buried and rose again the third day. I had this head knowledge. But it never made it down here. Why? Because I did not have God's perfect written word. And through the Bible version issue, I was given God's perfect written word. And that's when I learned about repentance. They took repentance out. And the Bible building I was going to, there is no repentance. It's only believe, only believe. Amen. I was a babe in Christ when I first got saved. I had to start unlearning all the garbage that I was lied to and deceived. And I had to start learning truth and replacing it with truth. There's times that I opened my mouth thinking I knew what it was as a babe in Christ. I knew truth as a babe in Christ, and I inserted foot. I made a fool of myself. And I had brethren that were kind enough, that had meekness and love, that answered a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. They corrected me in meekness and showed me the error of my ways. 1 Corinthians 3.1 and I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. I have fed you with milk and not with meat, for hitherto you were not able to bear it, neither yet now are ye able. There's a time when I was a babe in Christ, I couldn't handle the meat. You gotta feed him with milk. But the important part was is I was speaking as a fool. The things I said were foolish. They weren't Bible doctrine. They were doctrines of devils. They, it wasn't in the Bible. And to this day, I still have brothers every once in a while hit me up when I say something, brother says Christ. They, in meekness, they'll say, hey, brother, that sounds good. But can you show me where it's at in the scriptures? And sometimes I've had to show them where it's at in the scriptures because it's there. And there's times where I'm like... can't find it. And then I stop and think and said, Lord, where did I get that? Oh, I got it from a teaching that I heard from a brother in Christ 
where they get it from a teaching that they heard from another brother in Christ. And so it becomes PWC, Polly won a cracker. I've been, I, I've, I failed you, brother, says Christ. There's times where I've been a PWC, Polly won a cracker. I have parroted what someone else said because it sounded good, and I've passed on that teaching, but was it truly in the scriptures? I'm working on it, brother, says Christ. I still, sometimes, every once in a while, I slip up and say something, and a brother in Christ will say, hey, he doesn't just come out and say, you're a fool, like accusing me of being lost or saying, you're being foolish. He's just kind and says, hey, can you show me where that's at in the scriptures? And I start looking and I'm like, oh, you're right, brother, and it's not in there. And then I have to stop and think, where did I get that? Oh, I got it from someone else who got it from someone else who got it from someone else who made it up in their head because it sounded good, but it's not in the scriptures. You're going to come across, brothers and Christ, you're going to come across people that are messed up. You're going to come across people that get trapped, get not trapped, but have a bad habit of parroting what other people say instead of verifying it. Trust, remember that saying, trust but verify? When you hear a great preacher preaching and they're preaching something great, yes, but you still need to go back and verify. Most people don't. If he's, I'm of this man, that respecter of persons, I'm of this man, and if he said it, it's got to be true. But this is supposed to be our final authority. Like I said, not this guy right here. This is your final authority. And I love brothers and sisters of Christ that sit there and go, well, can you please show me where that's at in the scriptures? Just something simple like that. That's what that's talking about when it says, answer a fool according to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Right. Okay, let's get into the second part where it says, uh, go from the presence of a foolish man when thou perceivest not in him the lips of knowledge. Okay, He's there to be a snare unto you. He's there, man. We talked about he's not there trying to learn truth so he can come up to where you are, where God has gotten you in your walk with him. They're there to bring you down to his level. Right. Is this person seeking to mess everyone else up and to keep them from the truth? Cause division, cause confusion, just to backbite and whisper, to debate, to argue. Romans 16:17. Now I beseech you, brethren, mark them which cause division and offenses contrary to the doctrines which we have learned, and avoid them. For they are such that serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own belly, and by good words and fair speeches, deceiving the hearts of the simple. It goes back to what I just said, brothers and Christ. When I start parroting what someone else says, they had good words and fair speeches. And because I didn't verify it in the Bible... I was acting like a simpleton. What's the opposite of a simpleton? Someone who knows their book, who knows this book. Not perfectly, but you stay in it. Someone who says, okay, like the Bereans, they check the scriptures daily to see if those things were so. That's how we need to be. You become a simpleton when you don't revert to this and say, okay, I need to verify what he's saying is true. Is what he's saying true? Or am I just being a simpleton and listening to his good words and fair speeches? Something can sound good, brother, says Christ, but doesn't mean it is good. Something can sound like truth, doesn't mean it is truth. How do we know whether it's truth or not? In these last days, in, these last, in, the, in the past, you had to use spiritual discernment. I'm going to get into that a little bit. You have to use spiritual discernment. In these last days, brother, says, we still have to use spiritual discernment, but God has given us his, his word in one volume, his complete, perfect written word. You have it in your hands. We are without excuse. Anytime I parrot somebody and I get called out on it, rightfully so, thank you, brothers and sisters of Christ, it's my fault. I have God's Word right here. I should have taken the time to do my, my homework to verify that what that person was saying is true. And that's how you discern between those two verses, brothers and sisters of Christ. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou be also like unto him. Answer not a fool. Answer a fool according to his folly. It's all about this. Is he trying to come up to where you are? Or is he trying to bring you down to where he is? And you use spiritual discernment. It takes spiritual discernment. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 12. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit which is of God, that we might know the things that are freely given to us of God. This book is spiritually discerned. It takes the Holy Spirit to open this book to us. Anybody can read it. 
Anybody can quote from it. But they always make a mess of this book without the Holy Spirit. They always, and then people who are saved, they tend to make a, a mess of this book when they're being led of the flesh or the world and trying to get this book to conform to them and justify what they want versus what they need. Truth. God's way. Not the flesh. Not the world's way. Things that are freely given us of God, which things also we speak, not in the world, words, not in the words which man's wisdom teacheth. Remember what we read up there? A scorner seeketh wisdom and findeth it not. Because they're seeking man's wisdom. They're trying to find ultimate wisdom through mankind. Not through our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Not through God manifest in the flesh. People say, why do you say it like that? For there's one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. You want God's wisdom, you got to go through Jesus Christ. You want God's salvation, you got to go through Jesus Christ. You want God's grace, you got to go through Jesus Christ. You want God's strength, you got to go through Jesus Christ. I can do all things through Christ, which strengthens me. we got to go through Jesus Christ today. But which the Holy Ghost teacheth, comparing spiritual things with spiritual. That's supposed to be us, brothers says Christ. What gets in the way? But the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him. Neither can he know them, because they are spiritually discerned. What gets in the way? The flesh. The natural man. The flesh. Remember the old man? Paul, uh, yeah, Paul talks about, in the I think it's Corinthians, about not resurrecting the old man. He's dead and buried with Jesus Christ. The natural man that we threw at the foot of the cross. Lord, take this life. I don't want it anymore. Lord, I want you, and God gives you a new life at Calvary when you get saved. What gets in the way of us spiritually discerning this book? The flesh, the world, Satan. Put on the whole armor of God that you might uh, put on the whole armor of God. I want to make sure I'm saying it right. Put on the whole armor of God. I lost my... Thing up here. Okay. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles. Sometimes I get messed up on the wild, the wiles of the devil. Okay. What gets in the way? The flesh, the world, Satan. Those are the three enemies. We put on the whole armor of God, the helmet for a hope of salvation, the breastplate of righteousness, uh, the feet shod with the preparation of peace. We gird up our loins. That's an action. We gird up our loins with the sword that's the Word of God. We don't just have our sword. We gird our loins up with it. We use it. We use it to correct ourselves. We use it to correct our brother Jesus Christ. We use it to live by it. And we use it to judge other people by it. We use it. We train in it. We study it. Okay. You also have the shield of faith, putting on the shield of faith. But you do all of this, why? So the flesh doesn't get in the way, the world doesn't get in the way, and Satan can't get in the way. That shield of faith, the quench all the fiery darts. What are the fiery darts? Lies, deception, doctrines of devils, fleshly desires, lust of the flesh. That's what those fiery darts are. He tries to tempt you with the lust of the flesh. He tempts you with the world. Because they are spiritually discerned. But he that is spiritual judgeth all things, yet he himself is judged of no man. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verse 10. To another the workings of miracles, to another prophecy, to another discerning of spirits, to another diverse kinds of tongues, to another the interpretation of tongues, and it keeps going. But the point I want to grab out is discerning of spirits. You have some men that are called into ministry where they preach the word of God. And I've always said this, brothers of Christ, if all they're doing is calling out wolves in sheep's clothing and it becomes a drama fest, he said, she said, oh, I got him, I scored against him, a debating fest, that's not a good ministry. But you have some brethren that have ministries where they can turn it into a Bible study. This false teacher over here is teaching this, 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 probably a huge list. We're going to go through them one by one and see what the Bible has to say. That man is not say that's a wolf in sheep's clothing, stay with them. They have a spirit of discernment. You know what gets in the way of your ability to discern spirits? This right here. 
I know men that used to be able to discern spirits. Now they're so messed up, they can't tell friend from foe. They can't tell a brother in Christ from a lost person. If their life depended on it, they couldn't. Why? Because this got in the way. The flesh. The world got in the way. Idolatry. Doing things the world's way. The flesh's way. Me, myself, and I got in the way. The world gets in the way. And Satan is, is part of that. Causing a brother to stumble and fall away from truth. Okay. But discerning your spirit. Some brother have some good ministries where they're calling out false teachings, showing you what the false teaching is, how it doesn't line up with scriptures, telling you what the Bible actually teaches, and showing you that spirit of that man. He doesn't want truth. Remember what we talked about? You can discern the spirit. The man's down here. God gives us all a little bit of spiritual discernment, absolutely. But some have it greatly. It's a gift that God gives them. They can do it on a larger scale. Okay? But spirit, there again, it's spiritually discerned. It's not about my wisdom. When you start going off the flesh's wisdom, you start messing up. I know a brother in Christ that has stabbed other brethren in the back because he thinks everyone that's against him is lost. Uh, no. That's the flesh's way. That's the flesh's wisdom. That's the world's wisdom. That's not God's wisdom. Not everyone that's against me, brother, says Christ, is lost. And I've learned not everybody that tries to act like they're for me, pat me on the back, ah, they're not always saved. Okay, you got to use spiritual discernment. Okay? Not everyone that's for me is, is, is with me, and not everyone that's against me is my enemy. That's what the whole point of correction and rebuking is. They're against me falling away, and they want to see me built back up. Turn to Hebrews 4.12. For the Word of God, how do we do our spiritual discernment? The Holy Spirit opens this book, and this is how we discern. This is how we judge. Do they want truth, or are they trying to mess us up? Hebrews 4.12, For the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even the dividing asunder of soul and spirit, and is in the joints and marrows, and is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. We usually say, this book's got their number. You ever heard that saying, this book, the Lord of God, this book's got your number. This book's got my number. Okay. This book is the final authority. This is how we discern, brothers and sisters Christ. Don't be deceived into following. We did a study once and upset some of the easy believism. The only believe, only believe. No repentance. No, some of them not even prayer. And there's no changed life. They don't belong to Jesus Christ. They're still their own. They're not bought with the price. They're still their own. And whatnot, but should I follow my heart or should I follow the scriptures? This is what you hide in your heart. But a lot of them take this and put it down and go, I'm going to go with my, my gut. I'm going to go with my heart and feelings. No, it's the word of God. We discern through the word of God. Titus chapter 3, verse 10. Titus chapter 3, verse 10. A man that is an heretic after the first and second admonition reject, knowing that he that is such is subverted and sinneth, being condemned of himself. Now notice it does not say a lost man. A lost man that is a heretic. I only have to do this with lost people. It doesn't say that. It doesn't say saved either. What does it say? But a man, a man that is a heretic. That's for both saved and lost. All right? It includes both, brothers and Christ. What's an admonition? First, we're going to get to the first, it's first and second admonition. Okay? Admonition, it's a noun, it means gentle reproof. Counseling against a fault. Counseling, what's the whole point? We're going to get to this. The whole point is to get them back in a standing position, not to destroy them utterly and completely, but to build them back up. Someone who doesn't want the truth, it's going to destroy them utterly and completely and show them for who they really are. But that wasn't our intent. Our intent for saved sinners, because sometimes you have professing Christians, and you're not going to know on the spot whether they're truly saved or not. But you treat them like they're saved because they profess to be saved, and you're just trying to counsel them against a fault. Instructions and duties caution them. Oh, you're starting to get in the, in the, into heresy. You're starting to get into doctrines of devils. Be cautious. Be careful. You're starting to stray from the Word of God and go off feelings and opinions. Traditions of men, rudiments of the world, and not after Christ. Okay. 
caution, direction, and church discipline, and church discipline, public or private. I prefer private first, public second. That's me. Okay? Paul had to stand up to uh, Peter to his face. He was stood him to his face. There's times where you have to do it publicly. I understand. But I always prefer privately than publicly. If there's no chance to do privately, publicly it is. Okay? Public or private. Paul was dropping by. He didn't have a chance to do it privately. He had, he had to rebuke Peter to his face, get him back on the right path, and then he had to get back out there doing the work of the Lord. Evangelism. Public or private reproof to reclaim an offender. Reclaim. Build him back up. Get him back on the right path. Get him back to where you can fellowship with them. Because the last part is a step towards breaking fellowship. It's a step. Okay, admonition. It's a step towards breaking fellowship. Remember what it says up here. A man that is a heretic, after the first and second admonition, reject. You've got to break fellowship with them. You know, I've had great division. Not, I don't want to say great, but I had a brother in Christ that was a mentor that we butted heads on a subject and we had to go our separate ways. And he'll quote this verse towards me, but he never once, never once came to me with a first admonition or a second admonition. He never once did. Brother says, Christ, I just want to point this out real quick. The camera doesn't count. Okay? It's so easy to call out someone in a camera and just... Err, err. You ever heard that saying, Brother says, Christ, telephone tough guy? Back in the day when you just had phones, and I forgot to unplug this one. <laughs> I don't want interruptions, and sometimes I get ahead of myself. But the old phones that weren't even wireless, they had the cords and everything, they're called telephone tough guy. Oh yeah, oh yeah, uh, it's too bad you couldn't say it to my face. You know, you could be a telephone tough guy. It's so easy to yell at the camera, brother says Christ. It's, it takes a lot more courage to deal with that person face to face, especially if you love them as a brother in Christ. It takes a lot more courage. I failed this. I had to do an apology to a brother in Christ, and then I, we went through the Bible the proper way to correct someone. I don't just come out and publicly rebuke them. I need to go to them with courage, and I need to go to them and talk to him and try to gain him and win him back to Christ. Okay? The first and second admonition, it's done face to face first. Or it's done, like whether it's private or it's public, it's still done face to face. Okay. Remember Paul in Corinthians, he wrote a letter to the Corinthians telling them how they were wrong getting into the flesh and fornication and said, I'm going to come to you and rebuke you. I'm going to come to you and correct you. And, you're and he says, You're so blessed that I'm doing it through a letter first, because if I was to rebuke you right now, because Paul was very angry with them, he wouldn't be able to correct him in meekness. He was angry with them. So he wrote a letter first and then said, I'm going to come to you and correct you a, a second time face to face. Okay. It's not attacking to seeking, it's not an attack seeking to destroy, brothers and Christ, but reproof, through instruction to get said man back on the right path. But a lot of people have been taking that verse, a man that's an heretic at the first act, and using that to just cause a lot of division, to trying to destroy people, to make myself look good and that person look bad. It's not about me looking good, brothers and Christ. It's about us magnifying this and lifting this up. The Word of God. I'm going through the Psalms right now and it talks about giving God the glory, praising God, giving God thanks, remembering everything He did for you. It's God that matters. I don't want to look good and that person look bad. I want God to shine through both of us. And I want both of us to be on the same page. The Bible says, Paul says, we're supposed to be of the same mind and of the same judgment, striving together. Not fighting, striving together. But like I said, what do people do with these verses? They misuse them. Okay? A man that is a heretic, I know a brother in Christ that if you go against him and tell him kick his lowercase g gods, and you tell him he's wrong, you automatically become a heretic. And he'll be, a, he'll be a, what I call a camera tough guy. He's a camera tough guy. 
But he won't come to you and talk to you face to face in a brotherly way with brotherly love. I failed that. I failed that. I did the same thing. I'm guilty, brother says Christ. I'm not innocent. I think we're all guilty of failing to do this the right way. Second, what happens to people, 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 16. As also in all the epistles, speaking in them of the, these things, in which are some things hard to be understood. Remember milk versus meat? If you're a babe in Christ, the meat's hard to understand. You won't get it sometimes. It'll take time and trust that this word is correct, that this God's word is perfect, and what he says is truth. It'll take time. You might not get it at first, but you believe in it, and over time, God will open the scriptures to you and, and give you the meat. It's hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable, unstable, rest. How do you know those people? They, they lose their temper a lot. They raise their voice a lot. There's nothing wrong with, with raising your voice to make a point. You're making a point. But I'm talking about those that the, they're, they're just raising their voice a lot. They're getting angry. They're yelling at the camera a lot. They're yelling behind the pulpit a lot, hitting the pulpit, throwing the Bibles left and right. They're unstable. And what they do is they rest, as they do also the other scriptures, unto their own destruction. They rest the scriptures to their own destruction. What gets in the way? Pride. What's the pride do? Pride goeth before destruction, the Bible says. Pride gets in the way. They don't humble themselves and say, God, help me to conform to your word and show me the truth. Show me what I need to see, not what I want to see. You know, when I was a babe in Christ, I used to do Bible studies where I'd, I'd write, this is absolute truth. Okay, now let's get the Bible to prove it. That's the wrong way to do a Bible study, brother, says Christ. And there's men out there behind these pulpits and on YouTube and behind the camera. That's how they do things. I want to believe this. Now let's force the Bible to line up with what I want. They rest the scriptures to their own destruction. God had to teach me. There's times where I started a study and I had to crumple that study up and throw it in the waste can. Why? Because I went into it saying, Lord... This has to be truth, and God goes, no, it isn't. There's times where I, I don't really throw it that much, but there's been times where I had to throw it, and I said, okay, I'm starting this all over because the way you're teaching it, Lord, it's way different than what I, what I thought it was. And I had to start the teaching all over. I said, okay, Lord, we're doing it your way. Show me what I need to see. There's times where I said, this sounds good, and I went to the scriptures and said, oh, it's not there. This is what God, this is what sounds good. Not this. This. Amen. Now, P.S. Be careful. Be very careful with the phrase, it implies it. Brother says Christ, how many preachers have you heard teaching the Word of God behind the pulpits, behind YouTube, or any other video platform, where they're sitting there and they'll say something that's not in the scriptures, but they'll say, it implies it. Okay. It implies it. Wait, nine out of ten times when someone, when you hear that, brother, I'm just giving you the warning. I might have slipped up and said it. I have might have slipped up and said it. Um, when you say the word imply, nine out of ten times, the person is adding to the word of God. He doesn't, he doesn't like the fact that, the God, that God's Word either doesn't tell us what he wants to hear, or he doesn't like what it actually says. So he's either changing what it says and, then sa and saying what he wants and says it implies it, or God just doesn't simply doesn't tell us. He doesn't tell us. We don't need to know. So then they want to know and have all the knowledge. I know everything. So they'll say it implies it. They'll imply what they want it to say. I'll give you a good example of that. I got into a disagreement with the brother in Christ over the word Christian. In Acts chapter 11, verse 26. And when he had found him, he brought him unto Antioch. And it came to pass that a whole year they assembled themselves with the church and taught much people. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. Now, we've got through this already today. I'm not going to get into too much. I'm just giving the example of someone saying, 
I talked to a brother in Christ. I had him on Skype face to face. And I was talking to him and I said, he keeps saying the lost world called them Christians first at Antioch. I actually looked at him in, the, in there and said, hey, brother, can you show me where that's at in the scriptures? I, I didn't say, hey, you're just, I didn't get on to him. I just said, brother, can you please show me where that's at in the scriptures? And I watched the man. He got in the, he got the Bible, but got all the way over to uh, Acts 11, 12. And he's looking down and he read it out loud. And the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch. And he looks down. He looks up at me. He looks down again. Then he looks at me. And st I stop right there. This is a man who says he loves the Word of God. And I believe part of him does. But sometimes his pride, like all of us, our pride can get the better of us. Sometimes we give in to the lust of the flesh. These things get in the way of you trusting the Word of God. The world. The flesh. But you think he'd be like, oh, brother, I'm sorry. I was adding to Scripture. I shouldn't be adding to Scripture. I, I just, I, I, in my studies, it's just a theory. I just think it's the lost world. He didn't have that attitude. I just think it's the lost world. Call. He didn't have that attitude. You know what he did, brother, says Christ? He looked down, looked up at me, looked down, looked up at me. And then he looked at me and went, it implies it. No, it doesn't. The whole chapter, they're not talking about lost world at all. Until you get to that verse. And then he says, oh, until you get to that verse, then it's talking about the lost world. He doesn't say who called them. Okay? He added the word lost world to the scriptures. He added to and subtracted from the word of God. But it implies it. It implies it. Okay? Proverbs 36 says, Proverbs chapter 30, verse 6 says, Add thou not unto his words, lest he reprove thee, and thou be found a liar. Was it two weeks later, after I corrected him, and said, But it's not in the scriptures, and you need to stop saying, Thus saith the Lord, the lost world, when it doesn't say the lost world. Sorry, I'm pointing at the, like the scripture. It doesn't say the lost world. You're adding to the scriptures. Two weeks later, in one of the studies, he came out and said, the lost world called him... He's, he, his pride and his ego, he's putting his feet down, and he's playing the yea hath God said, a better rendering would be. What God said there, and the disciples were called Christians first in Antioch, God made a mistake. He forgot to tell us who called him that. So because he forgot, I've got to... I gotta pick up the slack for God, I gotta play lowercase g God myself, and I've gotta insert it into the text. Okay. We're not supposed to do that, brothers and Christ. And part of the falling away, we'll do a whole other study on this, but part of the falling away is we, I've been guilty of it, we have been suckered into playing the yea hath God said a better rendering would be game. Somewhere in my teaching, I keep getting, having to correct myself saying, okay, I said this, but it's not actually there. I said this, but that's not the way God said it. I need to stick with the scriptures that this is perfect, and if this is perfect, I need to say it this way. If it's not perfect, then I need to find another Bible. Stop pretending to be a Bible believer and correcting the Word of God. Adding to and subtracting from the Word of God. Okay. Now notice I said nine out of ten times that they say it implies it, they're adding to the scriptures. You said nine out of ten times. What about that tenth time? I believe... Okay, that they're mistaking it. And instead of saying, uh, by, it should be, sometimes we'll say by default. Okay, if you do this, this will happen. If this isn't happening, it's because you're not doing this. It's called by default. A good example of that is Psalms 111. Psalms 111.10. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. You know the, the great ones that can really discern Spiritual, have spiritual discernment are the ones that really fear God. The ones that lose that discernment are the ones that stop fearing God and they start fearing man. They start fearing their own flesh. Why? Because their flesh comes first. The world comes first. God comes last. They lose that. But the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. A good understanding have all they that do His commandments. His praise endureth forever. If you fear God, by this says, if you fear God, you're going to do His commandments. 
So by default, if you're not doing his commandments, you don't fear God. Some people say, well, it implies that that's the wrong word to use. And I might have used it that way. Please forgive me, brother, sister Christ. It's by default. It's saying that if you fear God, you're going to keep his commandments. It's evidence that you fear God. See, people don't like that. They don't like evidence. I don't want to have to prove myself. Check whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. I don't like that. Do you fear God? Are you keeping his commandments for today as a, the life of a Christian? A Bible-believing, God-fearing Christian man or woman. Do you fear God? Well, let's see. Are you keeping his commandments? No. Then you don't fear God. By default, you don't fear God. Here's another one. John 14, 7, uh, 15. John 14, 15. If ye love me, keep my commandments. Well, you see, it implies here, we might slip up and say the wrong word. When you use the word imply, you're trying to add to the text every time. Except nine out of ten times. That tenth time, you're misusing, the, you're doing, using the wrong word, but this is Christ. We need to get the word imply out. It needs to either say it, compare it, script, like with the thing about Christian. They were called Christians, uh, lost people called them. He needs to be able to compare scripture with scripture and show me somewhere where it says the lost are the ones calling them Christians first at Antioch. There might be another telling. Sometimes, Brother Jesus Christ, there's multiple tellings of a story. And it doesn't give us all the information here, but it gives us a little bit more information over here. And then we learn something over here that we didn't learn here and here, but there's three tellings of the same story. It's called rightly dividing the word of truth. Comparing Scripture with Scripture with Scripture. You can do that. It doesn't say it here, but it says it over here. It needs to say it somewhere, brothers and sisters in Christ. No, it just implies it. I'm just going to insert it into the text. It just implies it. No. There's sometimes we say the wrong thing, and we say we mean by default. By default. If you love him, the evidence that you love Jesus Christ is you're keeping his commandments. What's the number one commandment for today? Obey the gospel. And then we have other commandments. I just read one. And meekness, instructing those that oppose themselves. When you see someone that gets all prideful and puffed up, full of bitterness and hate and anger without a cause... You're not, you're not seeing someone that loves Jesus Christ anymore. You're seeing someone who's getting messed up by the flesh because they're loving the flesh. They're loving the world. I had a brother turn his back on me and break fellowship with me so he could have the world. He didn't break fellowship with me because I was off on the scriptures. He broke fellowship with me so he could have the world. And it can entice the flesh and please the flesh. Where's his love? It's not for Jesus Christ. Why? Because if it was for Jesus Christ, he'd keep his commandments. So by default, if he's not keeping God's commandments, he doesn't love Jesus Christ or she. See, this is by default, not saying it implies. No, it's saying by default. It says if you love Jesus, you'll keep his commandments. If you find that you're failing to keep his commandments, it's because you're having love for something else that's getting in the way of your love for Jesus Christ, brothers and sisters in Christ. And you need to get back to your first love. You need to get back to your first love. Another one, one last example, John 14, 23. John 14, 23. Jesus answered and said unto them, If a man love me, it's a condition. If a man love me, he will keep my words. And my Father will love him, and we will come unto him and make our abode with him. If a man love me, he will keep my words words. So by default, if you're not keeping God's words, you're playing the yea hath God said game. A lot of people like to play religion. And they, that some of them even try to pretend to be Bible believers when they're not. And they have no problem messing this book up. Adding to, subtracting from, ignoring, wrestling the scripture, trying to twist the scriptures and wrestling them to their own destruction. Those aren't people that love Jesus Christ. Those are people that love themselves that love the world, trying to please someone else other than Jesus Christ. I've been re preaching this a lot because I've been going through a lot with testimonies. I've got a huge testimony study, I want to, a testimony study I want to get out eventually on how to do testimonies, what testimonies are for, and Bible definition of testimonies. There's a lot of different definitions. Okay? But Enoch had this testimony. Before he was caught up, Enoch had this testimony that he pleased God. You know what gets in the way of your loving Jesus Christ, fearing God? Is you don't want to please Him, you want to please this right here. 
Now it's twofold to this. I'm talking about the flesh, like each individual person, take your finger and point it right here. You're trying to please this. But sometimes you're trying to please the man behind the camera. That respect our persons. You're trying to please the world. Wives, husbands, children, family members, co-workers. Sometimes Satan gives you offers. The world comes a-knocking and gives you an offer to turn your back on this. And some of you, brothers of Christ, have been guilty of taking it. I speak from experience. As a babe in Christ, I kept getting all these worldly offers. This is the world at the door. We have an offer for you. I kept getting all these offers because Satan was trying to get me away from this. Trying to get me away from doing what God said to do. All right? If a man love me, he will keep my words. So by default, if you're not keeping his words, something's getting in the way of your love for Jesus Christ. Love is not a feeling, it's an act of your will. It's an action. Taking God's word, hiding in your heart, and living it. That's true love for Jesus Christ. Taking God's word, his commands, and making sure that you're obeying them in the life that you're living, that's loving Jesus Christ. Taking God's word and obeying them, that's true fear for the Lord. It proves that you fear God above everyone else. I'm going to obey God rather than man. Remember? I think it was Peter that said that when he got accused. Didn't we tell you not to preach the gospel? We ought to obey God rather than man. Okay? Be very careful with brethren that say it implies it. It's basically there. It's basically there. No, you put it there. It's not there. You're trying to put it there. And you're trying to get us to put it there. I'm going to stick with the scriptures. I'm going to please God, not you. Like I said, there's times I've said things that aren't in the scriptures. And brethren have been nice about it. Chapter and verse. That we need to go back to that, brothers and Christ. That hasn't been done in a while. We need to go back to chapter and verse. And be in meekness. Humble ourselves in meekness. Hey, brother, can you show me chapter and verse on that? It sounds good. I mean, it, I, sometimes it's, it sounds like something I want, but is it, is it what I need? Because what I need is the truth. Chapter and verse on that? Chapter and verse. Okay. Be careful with that. Mm -hmm. Next, like I said, there's just an intro to get our hearts right. We need to make sure that this is the final authority. Then we're going to go into the expository study. I saw this post. A brother in Christ, I believe, got very puffed up in pride and vanity. I saw this post. Because we're going to be going through 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Okay, This post said, watch out for these smooth deceivers. Don't get me wrong. There's people that with good words and fair speeches will deceive the hearts of the simple. What's the simple? People that don't know the word of God. But as we keep getting through this, he's taking saying people who do know the word of God, that put the word of God first and we're preaching the truth, he's saying watch out for us. We're the deceivers. Watch out for these smooth deceivers who tell you that within the attributed Paul line epistles, Paul was writing doctrine for the time of Jacob's trouble. In other words, Paul never talked about any other dispensations whatsoever in the Pauline epistles. Everything he said is for today, the time of the Gentiles, from the death of Jesus Christ to the catching away of the body of Christ. Everything he ever said was, for to, was about today, for today, no questions asked. He never talked about the Old Testament? Uh, yeah, Paul did. Did Paul talk about the time of Jacob's trouble? Yeah, Paul did. We're going to prove that in this study. Yeah, Paul did. Did Paul talk about other dispensations? Yeah, he did. In the Pauline epistles. But it was directed at us to warn us about something. And we're going to get that in, that, in this study. To warn us about something. Okay? He was addressing the body of Christ today, but warning us about something. Not to worry about the future and apply it to today. Not get don't, don't fall back into the Old Testament, Galatians. Don't fall back into the Levitical laws in the Old Testament. This is why they did it. They couldn't keep the laws. Why do you think you can? He did talk about other dispensations. 
Watch out for these devils! This statement I believe he made out of pride. And he, uh, I say ego, but pride and vanity. Watch out for these smooth deceivers who tell you that within the attributed Pauline epistle, Paul was writing doctrine for the time of Jacob's trouble. Watch out for these devils. We had a disagreement in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm getting ahead of myself a little bit. In 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, it talks about to, to the body of Christ being caught up today, and it talks about what happens after we get caught up, the time of Jacob's trouble. It's talking about two different dispensations in that chapter, and you have to rightly divide both. When he's talking to us about us, when he's letting us know a little bit about what happens after we leave. Okay? Now, I would say watch out for good words and fair speeches, because that's what the Bible says. That do not know how to rightly divide the word of truth and have a problem adding to and subtracting from the word of God. Taking things out of context. What was that saying? A, a, pre, um, a text without a context is a pretext. I think I said it right. The bottom line, you end up wrestling the scriptures to their own destruction. They want it to say this, they want it to apply to this, and they're going to mess up the scriptures because they want what they want. They won't submit themselves to the word of God. I've been there, brother, says Christ. God had to humble me. I pray God humbles this brother in Christ and gets him back on the right path. Romans 16, 18. For they are such that serve not our Lord Jesus Christ, but their own bellies, and by good words and fair speeches, deceiving the hearts of the simple. I reread that verse because that's what the Bible says. Okay? Smooth deceiver. No, good words and fair speeches. And the simple is someone who doesn't know the Word of God, doesn't know how to follow 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the Word of Truth. Rightly dividing. Now, I believe the Pauline epistles are written to us so we can learn something. Galatians, Paul started talking about the Old Testament, letting the, those of us today know that we're not supposed to be in the Old Testament. We're in the New Testament. He talked about how they did things in the Old Testament. That doesn't work today. You try to go through the law, you're going to be a debtor to the whole law. Oh, no, no, just to the ones I can keep. I'm only one to be held accountable to the ones I can keep. No, you're a debtor to the whole law if you want to be under the Old Testament. Do you want to be under the New Testament? Jesus Christ paid that debt. You're sealed into the day of redemption. He had churches that people were being talked out of their assurance of salvation. Okay. 2 Peter 3.16 again, I'm going to read it again. As also in the epistles, speaking in them of these things, in which are the th some things hard to be understood, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also other scriptures, unto their own destruction. Okay. Their own destruction. This is a long intro, because I really want to bring a lot of this stuff up, because we're going to get into it. Because i got brothers in Christ that I love and I care about. I don't want to lose fellowship with them. I don't want to have to, I have to, but I will. But I don't want to have to after the first and second admonition reject. I don't want to have to re to break fellowship with brothers in Christ. I hate that. I don't love it. I don't take pride and, and glory and break in fellowship with anyone but when it comes to brothers and sisters in Christ. I've lost good brothers and sisters in Christ over stupid, petty disagreements. Over theory disagreements. Not absolute truth disagreements. Theories disagreements. Flat Earth versus uh, Globe Earth. You're going to break fellowship over somebody with that garbage? Gap theory. You're going to break fellowship with someone over that garbage? It's a theory. It's not gap fact. It's gap theory. And it's just a theory. Where the devils came from. In the Bible, the evil spirits and the devils come from. Uh, things that God doesn't tell us, like what's going to happen in the time of Jacob's trouble. We're not going to be there. We both agree we're not going to be there. But you get into an argument over trying to discern exactly how it's going to happen and everything. It's not our dispensation. 
get into an argument over what the new heaven and the new earth is going to be like, what heaven is like up there, we'll find out when we get there. Okay. 2 Timothy 3.16, all scripture is given by inspiration as profit for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. We're going to talk about doctrine real quick. Okay. 2 Timothy 2.15, study to show thyself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be shamed, rightly dividing the word of truth, rightly dividing that doctrine. But what is doctrine? Some people forget, what is doctrine? I had a brother in Christ uh, make a good point. He says, whenever it talks about truth, it just says doctrine singular. When it talks about lies and heresies, it says doctrines plural. Why is that? I'll tell you why after we go through this definition. Doctrine. First uh, definition, or just definition. In general sense, whatever is taught. It's a doctrine. Whatever is taught, singular. You can be taught things of the past. You can be taught things of the present. You can be taught about things in the future. All Scripture is given by inspiration. Instruction righteousness. We can go throughout this whole book for instruction righteousness. But when it comes to doctrine, we do have to be careful. Some people can call me a hyper-dispensationist all they want. When it comes to doctrine, when it comes to the main teachings of today, it's the Pauline epistles. How we're supposed to live our life today. Brothers and sisters Christ, when Paul was preaching... The Gentiles, the, the early church in his day, they didn't have the Old Testament. Paul could teach them a little bit about the Old Testament. He talked to them about the Old Testament in the Pauline epistles. We talked about that in Genesis. Paul did talk about other dispensations. But they primarily just had the letters. And Paul said, read these letters. Okay. But doctrine is generally whatever is taught. Something that might be taught in the past might not be for today. Something that's teaching you about what's happening in the future, it's not for today, but it's going to be there in the future. Okay. Hence, a principle or position in any science, whatever is laid down is true by an instructor or master. Okay. I know that's, that's the Webster's 1828 dictionary, but God is the one that does truth. He's the one that tells us what's for today and what's for tomorrow. What's for today and what was for yesterday. But here it is, the doctrine of the gospel are the principles or truths taught by Christ and his apostles. The doctrines, they could say doctrines of Plato, no it's how it's plural, the doctrine of the gospel, singular, then you have the doctrines, plural, of Plato are the principles which he taught. Hence, a doctrine may be true or it may be false. Absolutely. It may be a mere tenet or an opinion. That goes back to answer a fool not according to his folly. Does he want the truth? Or does he want to believe whatever he wants to believe? Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest he be likened to him. Does he want truth? Answer a fool to his folly, lest he be wise in his own conceit. Help him be wise through the scriptures, through God's truth. Okay. But doctrine can be true and false, and notice it separates the two. Why is that? Titus 1.9 Titus 1.9, holding fast the faithful word as he hath been taught, that he may be able, by sound doctrine, both to exhort and to convince the gainsayers. Doctrine, singular. 1 Timothy 4.1, 1 Timothy 4.1. Now the capital S Spirit speaketh expressly, not our own spirit, not mankind, God through his Holy Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter time some shall depart from the faith, doctrine singular, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines, plural, of devils. Okay. Watch out for doctrines of devils. Absolutely, that's a good warning to give anybody. But be careful that if you disagree with the brother in Christ, don't call him a devil if you're the one that's wrong. I make sure, I, I try not to call anybody a devil, okay? I really do. I try to say, hey, they've fallen for false God. They're part of the falling away. They're getting into false doctrine, doctrines. Okay. What is doctrines of devil plural and our doctrine singular? Why? Because Satan has so many different teachings on the same subject. I.e., I gave the example of the gospel. 
How many false gospels are out there, brothers says Christ? Doctrines, plural, of devils. There's a lot of, lot of different teachings in the Bible. So why does it say doctrines, plural? Because each one is a doctrine, singular. One teaching. There's one gospel today. Repentance towards God, which is godly sorrow. And I'll say it again. When you come to God with godly sorrow, do you regret ever sinning against God? You, you see the consequences of your actions. You're going to go to hell and you're going to burn for all eternity. You regret ever sinning against God. God, I'm sorry. I should never have sinned against you. I'm worthless. I'm nothing. You're everything. I'm wrong. You're right. I don't want to go to hell, but what do I do? That's when he points you to the cross. And then that sorrow gets magnified because you saw him, Jesus Christ, pay the price that you're supposed to pay. How that he died for our sins and was buried according to the scriptures and rose again the third day according to the scriptures. The finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. Confess both in prayer. With the heart man believeth unto righteousness, but with the mouth confession is made unto or to or unto salvation. Meaning it comes before salvation. You confess both your repentance and your belief in prayer. I'm wrong, you're right. I'm wicked and deserve to go to hell. You didn't deserve what, what, what happened to you on the cross. Oh Lord, thank you for what you did. That blood that was shed on the cross is God's blood, and it can wash my sins away. Lord, cleanse me, forgive me, save me, O oh Lord. I don't deserve it. And that's where the last part comes in. Whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Repent. Believe, confess both in prayer, and ask God to save you. That's the true gospel today. How many false variances are there out there? Oh, you don't repent, but you believe and you say a prayer, but you don't repent. Oh, you believe, but you don't repent, and you don't even say a prayer. Prayers are work, repentance is work, it's just belief. Oh, you can believe, but, but you've got to do good works, and you've got to die in a state of grace. How many doctrines, plural, of devils when it comes to the false gospels are out there. Tons. What about Jesus? The name Jesus. How many Antichrist Jesuses are there? There's so many different variations of Jesus out there. Doctrines of devils. But there's only one doctrine of the true Jesus Christ. And you can only find it in the King James Bible. All the other Bibles make Jesus out to be a liar. They tear him down. He's not God fully and completely. He's just a servant of God. He's not the Son of God. Doctrine, singular, means that there's one teaching that's truth. Doctrines, plural, is where Satan takes and makes 50 different variations of a, of a certain teaching. 50 different variations. Why does 1 Timothy say doctrines of devils? Because they have the true doctrine, and now they're adding doctrines. They're saying, well, it could be this, or it could be that. It could be this, or it could be that. Or maybe there's many paths to heaven. Have you heard preachers that used to say there's only one way to heaven? They got so messed up. That, I think they're false. I honestly do. But let's say for the argue, sake of argument, well, they might be saved. They've gotten so messed up by doctrines of devils that they say there's many paths to heaven. Okay. The second definition of doctrine is the act of teaching. That's what doctrine is. It's just you're teaching something. Like I'm trying to teach you today. Teach you something about the Word of God. Okay. Ephesians 4.11 says, And he gave some apostles and some prophets and some evangelists and some, past, some pastors and teachers. The act of teaching. Some of us are called to teach. Some are called to preach. Be pastors, evangelists, prophets. Now today, Paul was a prophet. Um, he prophesied, like we're going to talk about, he prophesied of the future. Um, John was a prophet. Peter was a prophet. Okay. Today there are no more prophets as far as new prophecies. Everything we have is here. Sometimes God will give brethren the gift of prophecies where they can really read the whole testament and show what prophecies came true, what prophecies are still in the future to, be, to have it come to fulfillment yet. And to understand a lot more, I've learned a lot from brethren that were given the gift of prophecies in the sense that they were able to explain Revelation 
and open it up a little bit more to me. So I can have a little bit more, not full understanding, it's not my dispensation, but to understand the time of Jacob's trouble a little bit, to understand the day of the Lord a little bit more, to understand the new heaven and the new earth, to understand the magnitude of the time, I said the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay. But the act of teaching, that's what doctrine is, it's the act of teaching. You can have good teachings, true teachings, you can have false teachings. Doctrine of the Word of God, or doctrines, plural, of devils. 1 Corinthians 12, 29. Are all apostles, are all prophets, are all teachers, are all workers of miracles? We're not all called to teach, brother says Christ. We're all called to study the Bible, read it, apply it to our hearts, and live it, listening to good Bible preaching, and good teaching, and I've done that. But we're not all called to teach, but that's what doctrine is. When I teach, I need to make sure it's focused on this. Not this. What I need to hear, what you need to hear, brother says Christ, not what I want to hear, and me compromising to give you what you want to hear. Tickling your ear. You know, the Bible talks about itching ears. Having teachers having itching ears. All right. Third, learning, knowledge. Third definition of doctrine. Learning, knowledge. Romans 15, 4. For whatsoever things were written aforetime were written for your learning that we through patience and comfort of the scriptures might have hope. Paul talked about the past. He talked about other dispensations. To warn us that for, for, for times written for our learning. The, law, the laws of God were a schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. Right? We can learn from mistakes that were made in the Old Testament. Right? Number one mistake is they stopped fearing God and they stopped loving God. They stopped remembering everything he did for them. They stopped praising God for everything he did coming out of Egypt. I'm reading that in the Psalms. You had to keep remembering. You had to keep going over it. Brother says Christ, the reason you talk to God about your testimony of salvation and your testimonies, plural, as your life as a Christian, you talk to God, you talk to brethren, because we remind each other who saved us, why we got saved, why we need to get saved, and who it is we serve. We got to keep going over God's word and hiding in a heart because it's so easy for it to flutter away. Imagine your heart can only hold so much, brother says Christ. And right when I before I got saved, my heart was full of wickedness and sin and perversion. God, through His word, I start taking God's word, I start hiding it in my heart, and it starts knocking a lot of that wickedness out. And you start filling this heart up with good things. Now it's filled up with good things. What happens when you stop filling it up? Bad things start coming in and pushing all the good stuff out. Why do we stay in this book daily? Because it's a constant process. We have to constantly make sure it stays in our heart, this Word of God. All right? We gotta stick with the Word of God, brothers and Christ. We gotta stay in it. Are you reading the Bible every morning, starting your day with the Word of God, ending your day with the Word of God? Are you praying all day? Are you singing at least a hymn, one hymn a day? At least one, just one. Try to do a hymn every day. Pray without ceasing. Now, so did Paul ever talk about the time of Jacob's trouble? Because that's what we're going to get into. Did he teach us a little on what's going to happen in that time period? Because I got yelled at, I'm teaching doctrines of devil, I'm a devil. Because I teach that 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, he's talking about the body of Christ being caught up. And then he lets us know a little bit about what happens in the time of Jacob's trouble. There's two dispensations that Paul's talking about, and ultimately, I'm getting ahead of myself, but ultimately when we get into the study, the whole teaching is, is someone's coming in and getting them fearful, thinking that they're going to have to go through the time of Jacob's trouble. They distract them and take their eyes, they're taking their eyes off Jesus Christ, and they're putting it on the time of Jacob's trouble. They're putting it on the world. And we're going to go through a very thorough expository study, just like this intro is very thorough. Probably could be more thorough, but... Did Paul talk about more than one dispensation? Okay. Little, okay. Doctrine is teaching. It's teaching. That's all doctrine is, is teaching. Okay. Is he teaching us about today? Or is he teaching us about tomorrow? Is he teaching us about the past and trying to tell us, stop trying to grab the past and apply it to today? This is what's for today. Stop trying to go to the future. Here's what's going to happen in the future. Stop being distracted by it. This is what you need to apply today. That's what he does in 1 Thessalonians and 2 Thessalonians. 
2 Timothy only 3 7. 2 Timothy 3 7. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. There's some people out there I can't help. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest he, uh, lest he be wise in his own deceit. I want to make sure I use the right one. Answer not a fool according to his folly, lest thou also be like unto him. Answer not a fool according to his folly. He doesn't want truth. I can't help those people that don't want truth. I'm only here for those who want truth. And that's not pride, brother. I just, I can't help them. If they don't want truth, I can't help them. I can try to plant some seeds. But in the end, I'm going to go to people who want the truth. Do you want the truth, brother, sister Christ? Well, if you've been able to stick with me this long, then yeah. Praise God. I want the truth. Okay. Finally, brethren, I'm going to end this with this. 2 Timothy 4, chapter 4, verse 1. I charge thee bef therefore before God and the Lord Jesus Christ, who shall judge the quick and the dead at his appearing in his kingdom. Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort. I want this to exhort. I want my brothers to get back on the right path. I want us all to be on the same page. Loving the Lord, looking for that blessed hope, loving one another, hiding God's word in our heart and living it. I want us to all to be on the same page, the same mind, the same judgment, striving together. We're in the falling away, and I can't... I was talking to a brother in Christ, stop for a second. I was talking to a brother in Christ. I hate the falling away. I hate it. But God's word said it's going to happen. I have to live with it. I, I, I'm trying to fight. I wish I, I want revival in the body of Christ. But then that would go against God's word. And I was told that by a brother in Christ. That would go against God's word. He says there's going to be a falling away. What we do, we got to do our best not to be part of that falling away. What we can do is try to do our best to encourage, exhort the brethren and not be a part of that falling away. That this book is the final authority. Exhort with all long-suffering and doctrine, teachings of the Bible. Keeping it fresh on our hearts and our heads. For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. What I was talking about earlier, itching ears. I'm not supposed to be preaching what you want and what I want and tickling your ear. I'm supposed to be preaching what I need and what you need. When I'm preaching, I'm, I'm teaching myself and talking to myself as well as I'm talking to you guys when it comes to standing for absolute truth. Okay. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth. We didn't read some. So will turn into doctrines of devils, yeah. and shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things. Watch. We're going to find out, brothers and sisters. The word watch a lot of times when it talks to us, it's not talking about looking for the time of Jacob's trouble. Okay? The watch here is we're supposed to keep our eyes on Jesus Christ, living for him, taking his word, hiding it in our hearts, and living it. Why? Because you can get called home in death or in life at any moment. I could go home to be with the Lord today, whether he kills me and says it's your time to come home, or he says, hey, it's time for everybody to come home. That's what I mean by in death or in life. Either he kills me and says it's time for you individually to come home, or he says, hey, everyone, it's time to come home. Everyone, come up hither to catch away the body of Christ. You don't know when that's going to happen. You're supposed to be looking for that blessed hope every day. That's what it means. But the life that you're living, the mission doesn't change. No matter what's going on out there in the world, the mission doesn't change. Our job doesn't change. We're to please God. We're to live for Him. We're to be a light to this dark, dark world. We're supposed to have a testimony, a ready testimony. We're supposed to be in the ministry of reconciliation. We're supposed to be ambassadors for Jesus Christ. Watch thou in all things. Are you being a good ambassador for Jesus Christ? Are you living every day for Jesus Christ? Did you start your day with the Word of God, or did you skip it? I've done it sometimes, and it, it, I didn't have a good day. I was like, why is my day so hard today, Lord? And I was like, I got so excited about starting the day, I didn't start my day with the Word. I drop everything, go grab the Bible, do my Bible reading and talking with the Lord. It usually takes 30 minutes. And then when I get back to the world, I'm like, now things feel right. It just doesn't feel right if I don't start. When you get in a good habit of starting your day with the Word of God, you go a day without starting your day with the Word, something doesn't feel right. Something's wrong, Lord. I don't know what it is. And then God reminds you, did you start your day with the Word? I didn't start the day with the Word. I didn't start my day with prayer, talking with you about your Word. 
O oh Lord, right? watch in all things. How are you treating the brethren? Are you showing brotherly love? You can correct a brother in Christ. You can rebuke him publicly if you have to. But is there love behind it? Or is there bitterness and hate and envy and, and pride? And um, I want to say ego again, but I'm trying to do the right word. Um, just my brain freezes sometimes. Forgive me, brothers in Christ. But uh, ego, I keep saying ego. Vanity. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Vanity. Is all that behind how you're treating the brethren. Those are bad motivators that, that motivate you when you start treating the brethren. That's what motivates treating the brethren wrongly. When you're treating a brother right, even if you have to correct them, it's done with love and meekness. Watch thou in all things. That's what it's talking about. All aspects of your life. Being a minute, uh, the ministry of reconciliation, be an ambassador for Jesus Christ, living for Jesus Christ every day, being a light to this dark world. Be not conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Love not the world, neither things in this world. Okay? Um, you don't have to be a friend of the world. You have to make sure that you're not yoking yourself up. You've got to watch in all things. It's your life that you're living as you're looking for that blessed hope. When we get to go home, this life isn't it. It also has to do with you watching all things, not getting focused on the temporal, but getting focused on the eternal. This is eternal, sorry. But the temporal, all this stuff around me, these pens, the food I eat, the clothes aren't, this is all temporal. This body of flesh, this wicked body of flesh is temporal. Are you watching and focused on things that are eternal? Watch thou in all things. Endure affliction. When you're watching now in all things, and this is the foundation, you're going to have friction with this flesh. Afflictions with this flesh. This flesh is always going to try to get you down, and you're going to pull the flesh down. It's a struggle. You're going to get mistreated by the lost world. They're always going to look down on you. Satan's always going to, with him and his, him and his ministers of, that transform themselves into the ministers of righteousness, but I call it Satan and his minions, his followers are going to do everything they can to try to get rid, to silence you, and to make you stop being a light to this dark world. You're going to endure affliction. Okay? Remember, make sure it's not that you don't have a persecution complex. It's a whole different story. If you're just living for the truth, you're going to suffer con uh, persecution. Just by standing for the truth and living it. Do the work of an evangelist. Remember, you're supposed to be, have your testimony ready to give to somebody when the door opens, when God opens doors. Some of them might be called into street witnessing and be an evangelist. But do the work of an evangelist. Make full proof of thy ministry for the men in ministry. Make full proof of thy ministry. This is the final authority. And when I failed, I'm sorry, brothers of Christ. When I failed you, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I regret it. I try to fix it. And I try to start saying things the right way. I start preaching things the right way. With the right heart. Preaching things with the right heart. Okay. So we're going to get into this expository study. And I'm sorry the intro was so long, but I just had to get that off my heart. And plead with you, brothers and sisters Christ, that when we get into this study, listen to the study. And like I said, you can take notes and say, okay, I disagree with them here. And then be able to, if it's a small correction, do it in the comment section. If it's a huge correction, make sure you're emailing me. I do want to be corrected if I'm wrong, but make sure you're doing it. That This is the final authority. You're not doing it because you're being a respecter of persons. I'm of this person and he said such and such, therefore I have to defend it. No, defend this. Don't defend this. Defend this. I don't know if you saw my finger. Don't defend this. Defend this. Make sure you're using Scripture, comparing Scripture with Scripture. Don't fall for that. Yea, hath God said, a better render would be. Don't come to me with, it implies it. Don't come to me. It, it's basically there. No, it's either there or it's not there. That's always going to be my answer. It's either there or it's not there. Okay. Rightly dividing. Rightly dividing. So I'm going to end this with grace and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ be with you all, brothers and sisters Christ, and my love for you, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. Thank you for patiently watching, and I'll see you in the first part of this series.